Well, good evening and thank you for joining the November seminar of the uh, History and Games Lab uh, of the University of, uh, of Edinburgh. Uh, my name is Gianluca Raccagni. I'm the founder of the uh, History uh, and, uh, and Games Lab. And uh, uh, our seminars are uh, co-hosted also uh, by the History and Games Society, which originally was the student branch of the History and Games Lab, but now it is uh, uh, a full autonomous uh, uh, student society uh, as well. So our um, uh, to seminar tonight is about the Dungeons and Dragons. So the Eastern Games Lab um, looks at uh, and consider all kinds of games, uh, video games, uh, but also tabletop games of uh, uh, various uh, various kinds. Uh, and uh, this year, uh, a special interest of ours is role playing games. And uh, when you consider role-playing games, uh, of course, uh, you need to start from Dungeons and Dragons, which is by far the most famous uh, um, out, uh, uh, out there. Um, regarding the Eastern Games Lab, uh, possibly you are not all subscribed to our mailing list. Uh, I have included the mailing list, uh, how to the link to our mailing list on the chat. It's the very first uh, information that you find. Uh, uh, in the chat, and um, even if you are not based in uh, in Edinburgh, it could be uh, useful to you, not only because of our seminars are all online and they are monthly. Um, I will advertise uh, to the mailing list soon uh, the program for the for semester two, uh, which is almost complete. Uh, but also we are um, uh, starting to uh, organize uh, uh, online uh, playtests. Um, we already started, we already organize uh, uh, monthly uh, games, evenings and game jams in Edinburgh uh, in person. Uh, but uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have our first online uh, um, uh, play test. Uh, it will be uh, a role playing game. So we, it is a play test entitled Role Playing the Ancient World, online play test of Lex Arcana in Britannia, uh, which is uh, uh, an Italian uh, uh, RPG, um, which achieved great success and is currently on Kickstarter as well, as is one of the projects that we will uh, uh, discuss tonight. But without further ado, let's start now uh, the round table, which uh, um, was designed to include uh, uh, both game designers of uh, RPG products that dealt with the historical uh, topics and especially with the old ones. Uh, as well as uh, uh, academics who play D and D and designed their own uh, campaign. In this case, a campaign set in uh, early medieval uh, uh, Egypt. So I thought it was a good mix, both of historians and game designers, to see uh, to to explore um, questions such as, uh, uh, especially the su suitability of a game like Dungeons and Dragons, which um, was inherently fantasy one, um, for uh, for historical settings. Um, Perhaps how can we uh, play it historically, but also how uh, useful could it be for historical research? Um, creating a campaign perhaps can help historians thinking about their uh, subject matter in a more uh, imaginative uh, and creative way, perhaps asking questions that uh, uh, you were not expecting or uh, um, new questions that um, are inspired by uh, game design uh, itself. The, um, Roundtable with it will be chaired by, uh, by, by James Holloway, uh, who has uh, uh, a long standing collaboration with the Eastern Games Lab. And uh, uh, even more uh, uh, in the future, we are planning uh, more collaborations for the future. To you, James. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, Luca, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to start today's uh, roundtable by uh, just asking uh, each of our participants very briefly to talk about. Uh, their background um, and what uh, you know, uh, and specifically like the projects that uh, that that have uh, brought them here today. So, um, uh, Andrea, why don't we start with you? Um, uh, you come to this uh, as a game designer, so tell us a little bit about your experience there. Yep, thank you. So, um, well, I, I'm no historian here at this table. Um, I focus more on game design, and I do. I do it mostly in my uh, spare time. Uh, I've been designing a new fifth edition setting, set in the wall Middle Ages, which is based on realism uh, since 2019. And uh, we managed to launch it on Kickstarter twice. The first time didn't work out and the second time worked. So now it's still on Kickstarter uh, for a few hours has been founded. 
Yeah, I was um, about to say, doesn't it end like the day after tomorrow? Not today, but tomorrow, yeah. Okay, so get it while you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, so basically, um, I've been asking historians. We had to hire historians or ask simply ask for help. Um, and so we had a bunch of information on the Middle Ages. Um, and my goal and my job, along with uh, the other two collaborators working on the project, was to translate these historical details into new mechanics, because we had to shape fifth edition. We have to shape it around a bit to fit this concept uh, in it. So it would be a pleasure to, to discuss it further. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, let's move on uh, from there to, uh, to Ed. Ed, why don't you tell me a little bit about your uh, your experience with um, your fifth edition campaign? Um, sure. Well, I'm a postdoc uh, researcher at Nijmegen University, uh, Radboud University in the Netherlands. And um, so I guess this, the genesis of this project was that uh, Eileen and I, I work on Arabic sources, Eileen works on Coptic sources, both uh, in the early Islamic period of the Middle East. Um, and we were working in a project uh, based at Leiden University um, called Embedding Conquest. And we were looking at broadly how um, empires are sort of run uh, not as projects of conquest so much as the aftermath. What, what, how, does so, how does the social networks of empire hang together? Um, and we were playing, Eileen and I, Eileen started a, a role playing group and we were playing um, a bit of Dungeons and Dragons, a bit of sort of homebrew. We played a bit of Call of Cthulhu. And um, Aline was in touch with Jenny, who's also a, uh, works on Coptic. And the idea, I think partly uh, because of our experience with Call of Cthulhu, uh, we were interested in the idea of a campaign, a campaign where you're really looking at a historical period rather than this being a fantasy world. And then what would this be like for Dungeons and Dragons? And what would it be like for us as historians to, to use this as, a, as an experiment? Um, so we started doing that then largely through Jenny's. Uh, Jenny's involved with the games um, uh, network or lab, Manchester Games Network, right, in, in, at Manchester. It's now called the Manchester Met Game Centre. We've uh, grown from okay. a network to a centre. And so through her agency, we started getting more serious. We did a sort of pilot uh, podcast recording at the beginning of 2021. And, and since then, we've been thinking about going to a real play podcast. So we now have a, a full, well, uh, 17 episodes of a sort of mini campaign that we're now working on to edit and, and produce, um, which is a way of reaching out to an audience, though I don't think we quite know what we're doing. Uh, it's it's experimental. So I, I think I don't feel like I am an expert in this audience. I feel we're sort of in the trenches still uh, figuring out uh, uh, what to do. Uh, if you want to talk about why D&D, we can come on to that later. But I think I'll leave other people to speak. Right. Yeah. That I mean, that is, that is my next question. But uh, but before we talk about that, um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Jenny to introduce uh, herself and, and, and talk a little bit about this uh, this project. Thank you. So yeah, I'm senior lecturer in ancient history at Manchester Met. My background's in Egyptology and I specialize in late Christian, early Islamic Egypt, primarily seventh and eighth centuries uh, AD. Uh, social and economic history, largely based on Coptic sources, village life. And since I, I joined Man Met just over four years ago and their games was a network, now the game center, has gone at this interdisciplinary center that cuts across uh, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, um, maths, game design, uh, used to be geography as well, and education, and yeah, exploring more the potential of games for not just education in the strictest sense, but creative exploration, different ways to use games, different ways to use games to think about topics differently and so I've been doing this and largely I've been mainly interested in digital games and um, although previously more as a kid uh, 
been into more tabletop RPGs. And so when Ed and Aline approached myself and a couple of other of our players as well, putting this idea together, and just a shout out, uh, Shergosh, who can join us this evening, uh, is at uh, University of Warsaw. And we had for a while um, Alan Dar, who's in Hamburg, who uh, has had to postpone it for at least a while uh, his involvement. But yeah, it reached out to us and I thought this is a really fun opportunity, especially during lockdown. And I think that's a really crucial thing, you know, as a, with everything else going on, like looking for something else and different to do as well. And I don't know if lockdown hadn't or COVID the pandemic hadn't have happened if we would have had the resources uh kind of the impetus to do stuff online and so yeah all of that came together and we've been doing this yeah for almost about two years now all right fantastic um and finally Aline uh, so uh tell us a little bit about uh, about your uh work your background and then also about your uh, your involvement in uh uh in the uh, uh, I forget it has a proper name, but the early medieval dice on the Nile was that the Dice that's the, on that the was Nile. the event. Yeah. No, no. Yes. Well, we call we call the campaign the group. I don't know. We call it Dice on the Nile. All right. Um. So yeah, I'm Eileen. I'm finishing a PhD at Leiden University here in the Netherlands. I am trained as a classicist and Egyptologist, and my PhD is in papyrology, which is also Jenny's main discipline. So that means that I, for my research, I study everyday documents to try and understand people's lives, problems, how they try and solve these problems, social relationships that are reflected in them, and so on. Uh, like Jenny, my specific geographical and chronological framework is 7th and 8th century Egypt, which is also when our when and where our campaign is set. I believe we haven't, you know, <laughs> set a date as far as I remember, but I believe it's somewhere in the 720s or 730s um, that our campaign is uh, taking place. And for the rest, Ed already uh, told you our origin story where I was um, involved. And uh, yeah, as Jenny said, I do also believe that like so many people also for us, the pandemic and lockdowns were um, very important in making this, making this come alive and, and keeping, it, um, keeping it alive. You know, even, even if it's history, we are still, we still escaped our own reality by by imagining ourselves in this in this setting so hmm, absolutely um and uh, just real briefly too uh i know john luca mostly already did um but uh i'm james holloway and i uh you know he mentioned that uh uh i too am an early medievalist but my background is uh, uh in archaeology and um uh, specifically i studied uh burial practice in early medieval england so same period, but in terms of uh, Egypt, I know less than nothing. Um, so, um, all right. So the first question, as I as I intimated earlier, the first question that I uh, wanted to ask was because this is sort of we've discussed sort of what the impetus is to play role playing games in historical settings, but the question that we wanted to begin with is why D and D specifically and I, I i'll just throw that one open please don't uh um what was it that motivated you to pick this game specifically as the basis for the campaign because on the surface it seems like there are you know there are some challenges that might be unique to it um andrea what was your thing yeah yeah i can ask i can answer this question also because many many people asked us why we used edition i think is the, the most asked question uh, concerning our setting uh and not an on brew setting or other system which could uh, maybe fit even better the, the 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 background we're talking about which is history uh i'll start to say that probably fifth edition and dnd came into this project even before the the middle ages and the, the dam we wanted to to play around because when uh, we when we play dnd generally we we try to to add new element of realism to the game generally we always been doing this uh we, we always always wanted to have more realistic game approach 
so I started with some friends to just to include some homebrew rules which would increase uh, lethality of the weapons, for example, um, or use the brawl even more because I mean, I, I think that D&D, especially 5th edition, already contains some element of realism um, that then at, at, at the end, uh, they become useless after two, three levels because the magic strikes in and everything becomes useful. Who wants to brawl when you can do a uh, fireball? <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's the, 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 the thing that we didn't like from D&D from the beginning since we start playing. Uh, and I always like to play the, the lower levels. First, second, the third level, I think, are the best in D&D uh, because they, are, they can offer more realism at the game table. That's what we were looking for. So we decided, okay, why not starting um, to, to shape a new, a new setting of our own uh, on the Middle Ages? I think that D&D has um, element, historical elements in it. So we, we cannot say that I mean, there, is, there are shields, there are swords, so Middle Ages is there. Then there is fantasy, which is on a side and is uh, shaping the world in a completely different way. So what we wanted to do was to take the fantasy out and try to uh, highlight those uh, um, elements of realism that are already, already D&D. Were there other better systems to do this? Probably yes, but that was not the focus of our, uh, of our project. Um, so we started with the fifth edition first, and then we moved to the to the rest. Ah, okay. So that, was that the same story uh, for uh, for you, Ed, Jenny, and Liam? Is that that you were playing fifth already, and then uh, decided to adapt it to your setting? No, we weren't playing fifth already, but I do believe we thought about practical practicality, as in I think we knew or we asked that Jenny had played D&D, Grzegorz, uh, our colleague, also had played D&D. Um, I also had the books and the rules I was learning um, and Ed also already knew. So I feel, I, as far as if I remember correctly, please Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember that we had this conversation of how can we start as quickly as possible without players having to jump through hoops of learning a completely new system that actually might be might be better but then also we would have had to look for that other system and you know compare and it would have taken us even longer to get to get started i think that was at least one of the reasons why we chose why we chose the end that and accessibility maybe also for later mm. Yeah, I think we uh, absolutely, as you say, um, and that I, I guess that speaks to the ubiquity of D&D in the role playing world, that, that it, it is often the first point of contact for people, um, but we, uh, which as well, I guess we thought that in terms of accessibility in the future, if, if we were trying to build an audience, which we weren't 100% sure about, but we were definitely was on the table. So that seemed like a a, a possibility. Just to, just to respond to Andrea's point about um, realism, I should make uh, clear from the outset that um, we are we are very much interested in a fantasy world. However, the world that we're trying to work on is uh, supposed to be built from the worldview of the people inhabiting it. So we ideally not a uh, modern person's view of medieval fantasy, but what was the world that these people live in inhabited by? What kind of forces was were, were at play in the world? What kind of creatures were at play in the world? Um, which means that we can get away from realism, though I, though I think absolutely <laughs> we did have this issue of like leveling up you know, levels one through three. We've, they've just leveled up to fourth level after two years. <laughs> That's because me. And just to... I've, I've been slowing it down and they've been, the players have been baying to progress, but uh, they've been, you know, because then you get into a, a zone of epic fantasy where really, um, you know, these people should be the most visible people in, in, the, in the world, which we're, yeah. we're not quite there yet. Sorry if I interrupt you, Edmund. You, you guys are playing with the, with the proper... D and D classes, right? You, you're not using homebrew classes. Basically, D and D classes with a bit of tweaking here and there. Okay. 
Yes, so I don't know how much James wants to talk about mechanics and classes later. Like from my perspective, D and D, uh, also bearing in mind that we've only ever played as a group online because we're scattered across Europe, from Poland to Northern England. And for D and D, I'm not working full. I'm not plugging them. This is cheap, but D and D Beyond Roll Twenty. You know the number of resources that you have in terms of also sharing that with the DM for convenience, whether it's, yeah, on my phone as well so to that, check. That aspect of accessibility seems like it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it was really pragmatic. Um, I knew it, no, we all knew the system, at least basics of it. And in terms of reality, I think this is a really interesting point and like picking up from Ed and this idea of how would people in the early eighth century, so fairly early medieval period, have considered the world and this is a time when we have still within a christian and early islamic context magical texts magical right. texts used by christians by monks create like written in monastic context so we have that magical element we have obviously a complete devout idea in the divine divine yeah. providence miracles which allows also for other things and uh, from my perspective, we can go into classes or how you do character design um, later, James, discretion, but thinking that in my head of this period, well, slightly earlier, but like Hieronymus Bosch and Michelangelo, The Temptation of Ant uh, St. Anthony, when you have Anthony in a completely fantastical, demon-riddled landscape. And so for that kind of this idea, and yes, those are like medieval, later medieval images of fourth century, and earlier but still like the flexibility that has like this imagination of the Egyptian desert occupied by Hieronymus Bosch-esque yeah. demons. Yeah the um I, I, so uh this is something that actually uh, not to plug um but uh if you look at this is something that John Luke has been working on right this idea of uh uh, historical fantasy, right? So it's, it's, a fant it's a fantastic world, but a fantastic world that's inspired by the fantastic worldview of the period uh, that's being discussed. So um, I had an article about that in uh, War Games Illustrated uh, not that long ago. Um, and there are more coming, so, you know, um, watch this space. Um, yeah, so the, and, and uh, so I thought that was interesting. Like, I, I'll, I'll have more questions about that in a moment, but um, the, the accessibility thing was, I, I was sort of waiting to see whether anyone would say that, um, because of course, I mean, what as as of twenty twenty, uh, was the coast estimated that they had something like fifty million active D and D players worldwide, or something ridiculous like that? I mean, it is significantly larger than all other role playing games put together, um, like, and not, I mean, many times larger than all other role playing games put together. So, uh, in terms of uh, so especially if what you're intending is something that has a kind of community engagement uh, aspect to it, then it, it's an unignorable game. And so I'm, you know, I'm forestalling comments that someone will come along and go, if you want to play a medieval fantasy game, why aren't you playing Ars Magica? Um, and say that, you know, the, as much as we all love Ars Magica, the, the worldwide community of Ars Magica players is the size of the number of D&D players in a medium-sized town. And, uh, you know, again, I say that with love, like, um so uh that, that that was interesting you know it's it's one of those things that when you it's a question that if you look at purely from a kind of game design perspective i think uh has a very different answer than if you think about it in terms of um you know either uh like uh reaching a community perspective or uh at the risk of sounding mercenary a business perspective um yeah, definitely. Um, so, and the, the, I thought that that, I want to jump off that point about um, the, it's so interesting that, that our two, um, you know, Andrea, you talked about this idea of uh, a historical game sort of necessarily being a more realistic game. Yeah. So that if we, you know, if we're, if we're playing a game that's intended to be historical, then it has a greater element. I don't want to say it is a historical simulation, but it has more of that kind of um an attempt to envision you know the real life of a uh of a historical period whereas um uh for dice on the nile we seem to be talking about an attempt to uh envision the uh the worldview the the imagined life of a um of a 
historical period, not wanting to get into any arguments about whether demons are real, you know. Um, uh, so, so that leads me to my next, um, my next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is I wanted to ask how that, um, how that research informs your work. Um, so, uh, for example, Andrea, I know that you said that you were consulting with um, historians during the design of uh, medieval tales from Europe. So tell me a little bit about that. Like you talked about the process and I thought that was a very good um, description of translating, uh, you know, that, uh, that information into um, another format. So um, what, was there anything in there that you found that you kind of were not expecting that, uh, you know, that um, didn't line up with what you had thought you were going to have to write for? Yeah, yeah, surely. Uh, so I, I have to point out, first of all, that the concept of realism, just to, to mention what you said before, it's a bit um, separated from the concept of history that we have in our setting. They are a bit different. When we say realism, uh, we basically mean that it's uh, it's not d and it's not fantasy. There are no weird creatures, uh, there are no demons, and there are no magic the way d and a minute because there is magic but it's a, it's a different concept maybe we can discuss it later the concept of history is simply the fact that the game is set in an historical period which is the middle ages um so yeah so we had to we had to talk with historians before starting uh because you know as long as i like middle ages there were details that we didn't know from the beginning um but we have to give them a direction first of all because most of them they they never played a role-playing game so we had to tell them what we were looking for what kind of format at the beginning they started to give us huge files with huge a lot of information and and progressively i had to you know work with them in in uh and in, in trying to 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 make them understand what i was looking this i was looking for uh, because we had to accept some approximation of course you may imagine we're discussing we're talking about 1000 years um and we're talking about weapons languages cultures so how do do you translate this into a game so we had to accept of course some approximation we have to create macro groups of cultures macro groups of languages and um and same goes for the for the new uh, 11 classes that we introduced we had to we had to make them flexible enough to be uh, to be played in uh, in a period, for example, sooner after the fall of the Western Roman Empire or in the 13th century. I mean, they are so different. So how how, how we do that? Uh, and and uh, so we had to ask those historians to to give us what are the common features of those people. Um, just to cite few classes, for example, the artist, the healer. We have the arcanist, the noble. What they have in common in this 1,000 year history. And, uh, and then starting from that information, we had to translate everything into mechanics. And one one thing was very important from the beginning, was very clear in the shape of this project that we wanted to touch the fifth edition less possible. So we wanted to be more conservative. Uh, otherwise there was no point to use fifth edition at all if you want to change it. Um, yeah, does, does this answer? Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, uh, so I guess same question. So now, um, when we were talking about this uh, before, and of course you mentioned this in your um, uh, in your uh, introductions as well, um, uh, Jenny and Aline, you were saying that that the era that you're playing your game in is kind of more your specialty than Ed's. Um, so uh, what? You know, when 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 preparing for this game, and, and and you even said that you had to kind of give him the the resources to some extent needed to to get ready. So what what are those resources, right? What what um what what parts of the setting, you know, if you if you study a historical period, how what is the selection process like for like? Well, now I need to give information about this period uh, to a dungeon master. Like, where do you begin? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different questions, one or different parts of that. One is the physical, the geographic location. And sure. initially we did give Ed some like, oh, like, okay, we're in a monastery, like this is like a standard one. And Ed went and found some of his own. It's like, no, that's a different monastery. Like, why are you sending us like that's in a different place? 
but ultimately that doesn't like based on the archaeological record right so much is lost that there's also that creative reconstruction of a landscape uh yeah and building up that and like especially so many of our sites are under modern habitation like we just don't know what the urban landscape was for so many but well, i think for every place we've been so far so there's a little you know it's kind of like a creative reconstruction and imagining of the elements that would be there so it's been a light touch in terms of that uh, things may change when we get to say uh, i mentioned to james before we started that um i'm going to take over and dm a little mini campaign uh, which will be in the region that i primarily uh, work on and so it'd be interesting to see like the difference with me maybe micromanaging as such kind of like the actual landscape and the reality of that compared to how ed's done it previously so and the site we'll be working on has a much better known landscape right arch architecture as well uh but then the other thing is sending things like magic i'll hand over to a link because that's more where her character is based yes so the second thing we did was just provide ed with some like handbooks or um, major um like information where books that had a lot of information on one particular topic that could be very practical like indeed a book that has um an enormous amount of translations of magical text as uh, Jenny was uh, talking about earlier. I also we shared a, a book that has come out recently with um, thousands, I can say of uh, objects with prices, so that Ed can look up, you know, what would a piece of I don't know, blah, 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 cost in that time. And there's an actual reference work for him there talking about, you know, historical realism. Mm. Um, uh, also, oh, a book of names that are used in uh, Coptic uh, documents from uh, that period and, and earlier and later, because we noticed that, I mean, Ed mentioned this, that he had sometimes difficulty coming up with Coptic names or, you know, local names for NPCs, you know, in the moment. Yeah. So we provided also reference work for that. So it was actually also, I have to say, a light touch um, for that. Ed did a lot of research um, without our involvement and also you know he's shaping the story he's in a way shaping the world although it's supposed to be historical reality he's shaping the world and um, we just basically provided him with lots of information where he can just pick pick um, small things to use in the campaign and then sometimes I don't know maybe he can say something more about that we would have a conversation more uh, character based um what where our character wants uh about ambitions and goals of the character and then related of course to the, the historical context that we are uh, playing in like what how how does she want to move move on with this how and how does it fit in the realities that that we know that we know about so it's those would be one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There's an interesting point about those things. You know, th things like uh, resources like price lists and things like that are uh, an absolutely staple feature of RPG books, right? Like every every role playing game book's got you know kind of catalog price lists in it, and they're useful not only in terms of equipping characters, but in terms of giving a sense of the setting, right? They're 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 information about the world, but they're actually the kind of thing that, from a historical perspective, you know, in a, in the pre-modern era, can be quite tricky, um, and it's it's an example of the kind of historical resource that uh, gamers really appreciate, and that actually quite a lot of the time isn't just lying around. Um, you know, if you wanted to, um, it, it, and 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 the answers are often kind of uh, counterintuitive. You know, you you but you wind up doing a bunch of research, looking at a lot of medieval estate inventories or something. And then when you tell people that, oh, swords are actually really cheap, um, you wouldn't think it, but they are. They go, no, swords are the weapons of kings. And you go, well, okay. Don't know why I did all that reading then. Um, uh, so yeah, well, I mean, was that your, uh, 
what what was your so what was your experience in terms of uh, looking at kind of what uh, historical information was available and then trying to turn it into a playable uh, experience? Then? Um, if I could leap in there, because I, I I would say I did a whole whole bunch of research on um, the uh, exchange rate between <laughs> gold and silver coinage and copper coinage at one point, and I have to say uh, I ended up just defaulting to D and D uh, <laughs> ten when there actually I did it um, twenty twenty silver to a gold, which seemed more a little more accurate, but fluctuations, you know. There's a whole field of research there about exchange rates. So I, I, I completely, like what Andrea was saying about approximation, I completely did that. And in fact, actually what we're doing more is a little more like um, the Call of Cthulhu mechanism where, you know, would this character afford that, be able to afford that? Uh, okay, so let's just- yeah, You have a kind of abstract wealth yeah. rating. And so I have as, as well, I guess I've, uh, so, uh, and I'd be interested to hear about Andrea's character. I mean, I think a lot of what we're doing is, um, has become less and less about, we started off thinking about, are there chairs, you know? Uh, would there be chairs or would people sit on the floor, that sort of thing, um, which is, I think, important work. More and more, we're thinking more about crafting character arcs. And so the D&D &D character classes interact with what we've, the kind of research that Aline and Jenny have been doing about their own characters, like what would my character be thinking, wearing, doing, feeling, um, and then the the the, the one of the things I think is D and D most uh, influencing what we're doing because a lot of it is, you know, storytelling with the aid of dice. But the D and D, the fact that they have this very uh, clear but also very rich, uh, differentiated um patterning of character uh progression that that does that has made a difference so I, i'd be interested to hear more about what andrea has done with character progression on that front like what do you do beyond third level or... yeah 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 no i so said first of all uh, thanks edwin for the question i'll ask i'll like to answer the james about uh, the the price of the objects sure. if, you, if, you, if you if you don't mind sure, go ahead, go ahead. it's very very important for our setting um we we give the the common objects, but also weapons and uh, and other stuff more importance than in D and D. Just imagine it in our new character sheet. We have a full section where you have where you list your object and you can give a description of it. Where where you find them? What what's the emotional price for you? Or um, What's the, the what's the price you know for that object, which is not necessarily the price that everyone would pay for it. So in, in our setting, objects uh, are more important uh, that classically in D and D, and we have to provide a new list of objects, um, new list of weapons, and we have to work on the price. Um, I wouldn't say that in the Middle Ages, swords were as cheap as in common D&D. I mean, they were surely more expensive than what it looks like in D&D, in, in &D, but you guys, you, you historians tell me. Yeah, and I don't agree with that at all. You, you don't agree? Yeah, but it's also, the, I guess it depends on uh, the, the the iron, probably, if it, if it was uh, more like a, it was easy to find or not. But it, or maybe it also depends on the on the, on the period. You, 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 it, you, yes, yeah. yeah. You, I'm, you I'm in this instance, I'm talking about in the later Depends on, 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 the, on the period. Uh, we had to work on the carnage for most important because we uh, after if you play for example after the fall of the Western Roman Empire you may still have some uh, um, Roman coins around but not, not very used. Then there is a period where there is just the exchange, so there is no coinage, and then from the the, the, the Carolingian coinage you start using that. So the the coinage story is divided into three different sections. Um, so prices are completely different than the one in D&D, &D, and I, I, I hope you guys will have a, the chance to look at them. Uh, and we have to find, of course, an, um, an equilibrium between the price of the sword and, and, and the price of, uh, of a chart, for example. And uh, what is important, I think, is or to, to, be, uh, to, to have a, a good um, proportion of the two. Uh, sorry, not proportion, but what I mean is that the, the price have to be consistent with uh, among the different objects and that's what we we have been trying to do along with the with the historians now i know i know you wanted to get to um to ed's point but i wanted to uh to jump back slightly because uh it sounded like you were talking so when discussing you know um inventory having like 
objects having stories and things, I think that's actually a very interesting example of uh, the game embodying uh, like a difference in mindset, because I've always thought that the kind of like the the, the shopping trip aspect of uh, of role playing games, while fun, like is quite a modern way to think about uh, sort of uh, objects and their biographies. Where did this thing come from? Bought it in a shop, um, you know, which is not uh, not necessarily particularly in the early medieval period. I think how people thought about this stuff that might be different in an urbanized uh uh culture in 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 the period that i study i think very much not i think object biographies are very important um and uh, uh shout out to kevin crawford's uh, early medieval game um wolves of god which actually has a really interesting section on this but i thought that that was a an, an interesting example of something that i think you don't think of when you think of you know doing a piece of medieval design like oh we're gonna have to change the way we think about inventory you know, it's not the first thing that springs to mind, but actually, I think it's really, I think it's really important and interesting. Uh, so, anyway, that was sorry, I cut you off there. Um, it's okay. Please go on. Yeah. So to answer the Edmund question about the level progression, um, so it, it, in our setting, which is based on realism, characters are generally human. They are all humans, and they are common people. Most of them are common people, except nobles, which is a class in our in our, in our setting. So they are common people, and they are no hero. So at the end of the day, what they want to do is survive. Um, and that's also because that's that's why the the equipment and the objects are so important because survival sometimes re rely on what you have with you when you are out in the wild. Uh, and this is way more important than it is in, in, in the end. So they are common people. They have they are no hero. But they have super strong motivation. So they, they, why they get out of their place, why they engage in travels. Of course, they have to be, they have to have very super strong, super strong motivation. During the level progression, they not necessarily become stronger in the sense that we have in D and D, which at the end they become almost gods. Um, in medieval, they don't become necessarily stronger. A sword can kill you at the first level with one, two hits. And a sword can kill you at 20 level with three, four hits maximum at the 20. It depends also how well you're equipped. So level progression in our setting doesn't mean necessarily becoming stronger. It just means you acquire more notoriety. For example, it's a new mechanic that we have. Uh, you acquire new skills in, uh, uh, in handling particular situation, a difficult situation. We have one only combat class, which is called the fighter. And is the only class that through the level progression acquired new combat skills. The, the other class, they have no idea how to combat. There are classes which are, let's say, um, in between, for example, the, the explorer, um, the explorer or the, the, the peasant or the, the scoundrel, which know how to fight. During level progression, they may acquire new way to mostly to, to defend themselves, but not necessarily through level progression, they become stronger. Or not necessarily when you are on a higher level, it means you are better at surviving. I mean, the, the whole concept of level progression it does not rely on how strong your character is. Uh, also because the paradigm of combat also changed because this game is less focused on combat, uh, but more on social events. So level progression mostly means going into the social. Can I jump in, James? On, uh, so one of the things I, I think is a struggle with D and D mechanics. I think it would be in character leveling, and I think it'd be within any established framework that you're adapting for yours. Is for example, my character is a Egyptian a Coptic monk, which obviously doesn't work in monk D and D terms. It's not Eastern Orientalizing martial arts monk. It fits in with the cleric character in character type in D and D. And for a cleric, when you're leveling up, you want wisdom, because that's where clerics get their mm -hmm. um, spell bonuses, like this DC from. And I mean, I'm a big fan of constitution as well. I like more hit points and I like to be able to survive. But then thinking about an Egyptian desert monastic figure, one of the things that interests me is like, how do you become, you know, how do you gather disciples? How do you become renowned? And that's not, it's in wisdom in part, but it's in charisma. 
But if I was to stack as I level up all those additional points in charisma, it doesn't benefit my D and D character. And so thinking about that uh, balance between game mechanics and what actually will benefit the character within D and D framework versus the kind of character I'd actually like thinking about the actual real life um, characteristics that would actually achieve like how does a humble monk become a desert father a desert mother that people want to travel from syria from you know everywhere in the, that early christian world to go and learn from because their renown has spread how does that happen constitution helps but you know it's you know different aspects of i mean and i think that that is you know one of the things that that any like attempt to make i mean this is true of any game system but i think with dnd any attempt to make it because it, 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 it's not even strictly in its modern incarnation like an epic fantasy game it's very much its own thing um and there are times when you have to just go oh well uh you know what does this mechanic represent is it a way of benchmarking the character or is it a way of uh achieving a particular game effect right um you know uh particularly when you kind of reach the little afterthought things like um yeah. uh, i'm trying you know i'm trying to think of a good example like 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 uh like yeah monks don't you know clerics don't use charisma but paladins do um which you know it's there because otherwise charisma is only for bards and it's not that useful oh i guess there's warlocks now but you know what i mean um the uh these these things kind of like we were i was speaking to my players the other day and and someone said and they were talking about you know taking a long rest or something and i'm like yes the idea that you're going to recover from these crippling injuries after a good night's sleep and a cup of coffee and a bagel like obviously does not make any sense but it's just an aspect of the game and we're just not going to try and think about it too hard um and there are always those aspects in game design including in historical game design but it's just interesting which ones we decide are the things that it's okay to not think about too hard because there are uh there are always things that will um that will seem out of place to somebody right um i, I wanted to but before we go i wanted to uh say I, I was uh wrote down some things uh while you were uh talking earlier because there were some things that you said that i thought were uh that i thought were very interesting and i'd like to start um Eileen, you were talking about this uh the idea of uh escapism right of the idea of um you know uh a uh historical game as a form of of uh you know a, a distraction a relief from um uh the world uh, and it's you know many <laughs> many things that you might want to be distracted from um and i thought that was really interesting because in general like my experience would be that few academics would i mean you're you're talking about work right like you're talking about the period that you study then is that uh, it, it did playing it rather than studying it change the way that you related to it absolutely for me playing our sessions is not work i think that's one because of um there is a certain leeway that I think we've started to give ourselves, uh, as Ed was also mentioning, after a couple of sessions, where we stopped being hyper vigilant about every little detail to get it absolutely historically right, and allowing ourselves to focus uh, in the moment more on our, on our characters and how they interacted with each other and with the world and noting things down like oh i want to look up how this this would have happened or i want to research these kinds of objects maybe for later but not getting too hung up on it in the moment itself i think that helped for me a lot to not not get the overburdened with the work that it would be and enjoying um, the process in the moment and I don't know, I think immersing myself in this um, historical context for me has been always a, a motivator to do the kind of research that I do in the first place, 
uh, working with everyday documents, uh, really banal, almost banal stuff, um, and and looking at oh this person couldn't pay his taxes so he fled the village and how is the village going to deal with that who is talking to whom about this problem you know these are the kinds of things that my read my phd is about um this is this is almost yeah the the dnd version of this is is the rdnd dice on the nile is for me just a play version of the research that I do, if I if I can put it that way, I still take it seriously. I don't want to just, you know, say, "Oh no, it's a game, so my character can totally do whatever," um, because I want it. I want it that way. Um, not that I I I do enjoy actually that that taking taking into account the historical context and being limited by that. Also, uh, for choosing spells and. Um, coming up with other game mechanics we, we can talk about that um i like these i like using these limitations to um to immerse myself mm. in the in the can, world right that, that's interesting so i i was very interested in that thing that you said about um you know not being so concerned about getting it right because i think when i talk to people about historical gaming one thing that is often cited as a you know, as as a reason that they that they're not interested in is it's a kind of anxiety about getting it wrong, and I always think like what's and 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 if that happens, the medievalism police are gonna they're gonna come to your house and lock you up like you know I mean oh, oh no you might think that there you know should be chimneys in 12th century buildings and that's rare you know like but but but, but it, i think it is something that people do genuinely feel um and so i was interested to that that uh i think it's maybe uh something that um you know uh, at the risk of a cliche the the more that you know about a period the more that you know you can't know everything about it oh absolutely um, yeah. yeah so uh i thought that was uh that was interesting that was your experience as well yeah if i if it's... i jump in james about this yeah. oh sorry Lynn, you, you were I didn't want to no, it's just going to just one image that I always have in my head. Like I, it's like I'm in the, it's like in a video game. You know, I'm in the world and I can look around 360 degrees around, but there are still blind spots, and it's just what you have to accept. And you can fill them in, and at a later time come back to it and see if it would work, how it would work, and that's just what I wanted to like. That's the image I have in my head for how hmm. I play this game. Yeah, I'm sorry, Andrea. Go ahead. It's okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. No. I mean, one of the one of the challenges that we have to face from the beginning was the historical accuracy, which uh, seems to be the the matter here. Uh, how accurate we are in the details we are giving. At the beginning, was it was clear that we wanted to be as accurate as possible from the historical point of view. Then down the line, we had some interested players and uh, simply interested people that asking. Um, information about oh you know i read this this sword you're describing here the handle was for example three four inches but i know from my resources it's not five inches was 5.5 inches so i'm not playing this game okay so it, it, it depends what you're looking for in a game i mean what's the degree of accuracy you have to accept a degree of accuracy if uh, if you if you agree also because i think 100 uh, percent accurate is almost impossible you guys know probably Imagine you would agree with me, you, you being a historian, there are a lot of information still disputed or unknown uh, or contested. So it's uh, it's really hard to say this is true, this is not. So there is a level, a degree. So what we did is instead of talking about historical accuracy, we had to talk about historical plausibility. Um, and at the end of the day, the game is an instrument in player hands. So if a player knows more about history, they are able they, they are free to enrich their adventures with more historical details more accurate but is it important to know history to play an historical game absolutely not you can play the way you like it so um th th there's something that that uh jenny posted in the chat as a response to that uh which is that you called this creative historiography and i think and now that's very interesting because um one of the things that i if you look back and 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 look at our there's a previous 
um, if you're watching this later on the YouTube channel, or I guess if you're watching it now, you can go to the YouTube channel um, and look up uh, a video that we did um, around the release of Lion Rampant uh, Viking of the Sun, mm-hmm. um, uh, in which I talk about this this idea, right? You know, historical accuracy versus historical authenticity versus creativity. This is a, a debate that has existed for a long time, or a, a discussion that's existed for a long time in the world of uh, studying historical fiction. Um, and um, I, I thought that phrase creative historiography was 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 very interesting. And I'm, 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 I do have an eye on the clock. I'm conscious where uh, we only have so long. But uh, Jenny, would you like to expand a little bit on uh, on that idea? Yeah, I think, you know, this idea of accuracy is an interesting point in terms of the historical discipline and was so still bound by dominant historiographies, dominant historiographies that are primarily elite, male, white, Western interpretations of the past and in very different pasts to your own and yeah over recent decades things change we're moving uh there's been rise of different historiographic traditions whether it's feminism or increasing like materiality like other things that come into the question and no, it's been a lot in discussion not just in role playing and board games but in video games this search for accuracy, authenticity, like it's immersive experience, but there's so many gaps, so much we don't know, you know, it's primarily in our period men who write texts, texts are about men, and so Alina and I are playing female characters, and so we have much fewer resources as well to build our world, so it's like, okay, what are the constraints in terms of gender, occupation, uh, Egypt's very different to classical Athens, for example, in terms of what women can do, uh, in terms of economic ability, legal ability, depending on uh, whether you're Greek and Roman, whatever period of Egyptian history. But, you know, there's so much that we don't know. So how do you deal with that when there is no historiography, when there are lacking sources? How do you play in the gaps? How do you ask questions? That, as Aline said, like make notes of things like, oh, actually, is there any evidence about that? How much do we know in my case about female monasticism? More stuff, not as much as male monasticism. How much can you extrapolate? How do you play with it? And how does that playing free up your mind away from, again, dominant historiography to ask different questions and flip things around? So play as freedom. And that question of like how, as Alan Paul said, it's great for generating questions. And I, I think that question about getting it right is a really important because people are so fixated in one clear and perfect idea of the past, which the more history you do, the more you know actually there is no clear and perfect idea of the past. And so how much freedom does that give you? And that freedom, yeah, as in the chat, to generate questions, to, to allow yourself new way, ways to think about things which aren't constrained by a totalitarian like, idea of this is history. And so for me, it's like one of the most important things of like my involvement, what I get out of it is that freedom. Hmm. Um, uh, now I'm, uh, I'm casting an eye uh, at, the, uh, um, at the clock here. Uh, John Luca, I don't know if we're, running over or uh no we have a few more minutes and also okay. uh, it would be good to have a question yeah i'd like to, i'd like to i'd like to get a close some closing remarks before we yes. um, before we wrap up all right fantastic so yeah um i mean i feel like there's uh there's there are so many topics here that that uh um you know we could uh, we could chase down uh, in detail we've spent an hour talking about this and i haven't said aesthetic of historicity even once um and uh and that's not until like now it. Um, not till now. Yeah, I had to get it in somewhere. Um, so, um, uh, but before we go, um, I would just like to uh, to close out with the thing that I was going to ask everybody, um, which is, uh, and, and we may have touched on this a little bit um, up to this point, um, uh, and um, uh, which is sort of what uh, what was the thing that you did not expect. That resulted from this project. So, um, you know, you went into it with certain expectations, or maybe not. Um, uh, and uh, and what uh, what you know what was it about um, trying to do uh, historical D and D that that was unexpected to you? Uh, Ed, would you like to start? Putting on the spot. Sorry. 
Sure, no problem. Uh, well, this this uh, sort of builds off the conversation that we've just been having. Really, I, I think it uh, working in a the reconstruction of a world or or, or playing, you know, doing sort of a ludic uh, research. Uh, really, I think it's just kind of opened up a different area of my brain. I think it's been dramatically influential. I I, I don't wouldn't say that I have any direct research outputs yet but just to um work in that mode where it's not peer reviewed you have to make decisions like that you're being it's in real time so you have to make decisions you can't you you know you can't go back and rewrite them um but in the world this is taking place in the world where i, I research um it, it really has dramatically changed the way i I think about the history of the period. It, it's so much more holistic. I'm thinking about every detail um, from cos cosmology to, yeah, what do you eat? What do you sit on? Um, none of that is, I, I, most of that is not going to go into my research, but it's it's definitely, you know, made me a better researcher, I would say. Um, and then I, I don't know. There are things that there are ang anxieties, I guess, that I that is produced. Like Jenny talked about gender. I, there's also race and slavery aspects that hmm. we haven't really. Yeah, that that's are a, every, that are everywhere. Yeah, that uh, but we haven't really engaged them in a story way. But hmm. uh, yeah. All right. Uh, okay, and and yeah, I see we have some uh, we have some questions in the chat about that. I don't know if we're um uh doing questions uh at the end john luca were you hoping yeah. to wait yes we if um well we have a q and &E, uh i thought we have a q and &E session at the end uh, i can read the uh the questions to you and uh, perhaps and uh, if you want to be involved also in discussing yeah that them. sounds great um so yes in fact uh you know given the given the short time um would we rather uh just throw open for uh questions from uh from the chat i think that that would be a uh, yes uh, and there I'm, are um... I'm, I'm excited to hear some of them talked about Yes, there are already several questions in the chat. I don't know how uh, Becca can go in time. Um, uh, I'll try to find them. If I'm not reading yours, please write it again, uh, post it again in the chat. Uh, also, uh, my son is here, so if you hear someone else speaking, that is uh, <laughs> my son William, who joined me, is uh, currently pay, uh, play, uh, painting miniatures <laughs> next to me. So <laughs> if there is interaction, in the interruption, that is where it comes from. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, questions. Uh, can you use historical RPG to communicate that idea of history as something beyond the list of facts to the public? I mean, yeah, I think so. I think it depends on how it's done. I think there's, I'd be really interested in Andre's perspective because there's one thing creating a, that world that has rules versus what we're doing, which as a group, right, we have that freedom because, and there's never a question about what is freedom in games within a rule set. Uh, I think I don't want to jump the gun, but like for us, I think there's freedom because we're not packaging, making, defining a rule set. And we can, with GM's discretion, um, be a bit loose and ready. Well, you don't have to try to get things. somebody else to play it. Exactly. Right? And I which think is a it would whole be additional interesting. Layer of yeah, I think yeah. it'd be more interesting if we're like someone who really liked Egyptian history, or, you know, had been to Egypt, visited a monastery, you know, to get in and, you know, find their way. So for us, we have much less scaffolding. And so it'd be harder for someone to jump in without being lost. And I think it's a different, entirely different question for Andrea. But I think, yeah, there's great yeah. potential there. If I can jump in from... Please. The perspective on I'm no historian, uh, and I knew not much, not a lot about Middle Ages before starting this project, honestly, um, and that's why we had to contact historians. But the the point is that at the end of this, now the Kickstarter campaign is, is is over. I feel that I know way more about Middle Ages than before. So surely there is an edu educational point to it. Uh, I had the chance to 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 know more about about Middle Ages, and it goes beyond the simple list of facts because simply because when you when you play when you're playing in, when you're playing the history you are free to move the way you like and to experience what's what's happening in that contest which i feel is something missing from the books or at least from what 
I've been told about history uh, from the school. Okay, so you have this would happen, it's this, it's this, and that. Okay, but you never had the chance to participate to those events or to to play to play yourself and to, to see how it goes. No, so so I, I'm sure that role playing games, specifically in history, can have an educational point, a strong educational point. Um, I think that that actually leads uh, pretty neatly um, to uh, to the next question in the chat, which is, uh, who's the ideal target audience? Uh, academics? Uh, uh, and I'm not quite sure what this next bit means, but I guess sort of novice or expert um, D&D people, I think, uh, uh, Gordon's suggesting. So when you think, I mean, and again, of course, obviously, um, Andrea, as as a, as a, as a putting out a, a you know a book for someone else to to play i mean i think that that's main uh maybe focuses a little more uh toward you who when you envision like the you know the 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 backer you know yeah. the player yeah what's what, what, what level of uh of of sort of engagement do you think is is a so the, the target of our game since the beginning was everyone able to play fifth edition everyone mm -hmm. enjoying fifth edition and is it's important to mention that with this with this with medieval medieval is a starting point it's like an engine and you use it to create any medieval like scenarios you like it doesn't have to be historical events it can be uh you can you can draw inspiration from literature for example you can play robin hood you can play king arthur or you can play a fictionary scenario i mean you you, you can invent yourself a new flag uh, which is striking in europe um instead of the black flag for example you're free to play the way you like so in our case our audience is is really broad and, and, and uh, i think the only um the only uh, the only requirement is that you as a player enjoy fifth edition and, and and history uh but again you don't have to play historical events you can play whatever you want because you create your own adventure uh, medieval is in fact a setting it's not the campaign model so it's mm. a starting point it's, it's like D and D, of course. D and D is a it's not a campaign model itself. It's, it's a starting point to yeah. create any other scenario. So, um, uh, how about for uh, how about for dice on the Nile? Do you feel the uh, the same way? I mean, how much of the uh, uh, how much of the background do you expect a listener to be familiar with? Um, it's a good question. I think there's an element of watch this space. I think definitely we would like it to be interesting to general you know public interested in dnd and history and uh i think there are people out there that just from the pilot uh episode we had some you know some very enthusiastic listeners um i mean as well it's obviously from the way we speak about it a primary audience is ourselves like we're we're playing you know with ourselves um yeah, so to speak yeah so but we'll, I think we'll see, yeah. we'll put it out I, and we'll see. I think one of the differences for us is that people have an idea of medieval period, knights, peasants, you know, yeah, and general true. aesthetic of Western European medievalism, which is why it's used for so many fantasy settings in film, games, you know, other media. Whereas us were, um, researching and playing in the very early medieval world, how many people know, like when I say they Christian Egypt, you know, the idea of Christian Egypt as well, um, what it means for Muslim conquests. Uh, we also have um, one of our players is playing a Nubian exiled prince. And so how many people know anything about medieval Nubia? Right. And you know, all of these questions as well. And so I think, yeah, it's our audience is probably people researching similar periods. So I, I don't know all D and D people or people interested in history and seeing how it goes in. Cause obviously we don't give those huge backgrounds cause we're all largely yeah, on the already, same page. Already, yeah, it's but I think yeah. first it could be more interesting what the audience response is, what kind of questions come up, what kind of disagreements or points. Like a lot of the questions that come up about, you know, representation, about playing uh, people's other than yourself you know, how that, like the sensitivities around that. And, you know, we're also playing for fun as well as trying to be respectful and finding that line. So I think for us, the litmus test will be, 
if and when we plow through hours and hours of a uh, campaign to try and reduce it to um, what we've been doing and the topics that have come up. Yeah, and um, actually, so something you touched on just there leads on to um, a couple of the questions that have uh, turned up in the chat. The next one um, actually was, does playing in a historical setting risk cultural appropriation, playing to unhelpful stereotypes? Um, but I think that that also um, uh, ties into Rebecca's question, which is about this idea that, um, uh, you know, g given that sort of D&D is the archetypal, uh, you know, fantasy adventure, come on and take their stuff, uh a game does you know is, is there anything inherent in the game that you know tends play toward um those kinds of things we had a and then um uh the the conversation in the chat is actually moving a bit faster than i can keep up with um but uh yeah uh, and um uh uh we uh next one yeah on the other side of that can it be used as a reclamation um to jump in real briefly uh myself when um certainly uh, so someone mentioned the idea that like you could have like this sort of you know like crusades uh, uh thing in a medieval game and certainly there is a kind of crusades fandom that uh you know they can be a little um um uh but i know uh that that was one of the priorities of lion ramp and the crusader states was to showcase the actual um uh you know sort of world of medieval ultramar that, that was not uh you know in in line with this kind of clash of civilizations narrative that's so popular um but uh but i mean stipulating that it certainly can reinforce these things i mean um, i also uh, think there's a problem with um our nation state centric uh, vision of what belongs to us and what doesn't you know just because we have ma national museums that say this is british culture or this is german culture and here are all the objects from our from our culture and there are the objects from another culture doesn't mean we have to believe that you know the renaissance was very much founded on texts translated from arabic that were themselves uh and a absorption from the Arab world's late antique uh, own late antique um, Greek inheritance. You know that's not a story of uh, that's a human story, right? That's a human story of the transmission of knowledge. Of course, there is you know there are issues of the representation of particular you know race uh, you know racial or ethnic characteristics that you obviously you know you should definitely be aware and be careful. But I I think it's you know, I don't think that you shouldn't be playing in a non-Western setting because you're not a Western person, right? Because I think we're dealing with a historical past which informs everyone's present. So it's, you know, it's complicated. But I would say that the question of appropriation is not the same in the present uh, synchronic moment as it is drawing upon the past. Not to say that there aren't issues, but, you know, that, that you, uh, yeah, it's a different it's a different kind of issue. I think that because we're valuing and exploring a, you know, a, a, um, a Middle Eastern uh, setting, that's that's good thing, right? That's I think that's there needs to be more of that in the in the public sphere. I would say, you know. Uh, all right, how would you? Oh, I'm just. Uh... There are many questions and comments. <laughs> yeah, we threw them too. Um, while you uh, you're looking at that, I was thinking, uh, uh, why should we do a, uh, a a medieval setting? What what the interest? Are are we? Um, is it just for the initiated of those or those who are uh, interested in medieval history? Uh, sometimes, and the question that I keep myself is that the human past is so rich in cultural, uh, is a treasure trove of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of cultural uh, elements and cultural uh, interesting uh, things to interact with, that uh, it is inherently, it could be in entities of value for, 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 for a game designer. Well, games have always, and, and historic and, and, and literature has always, uh, have always, uh, look at the past for sources of inspiration. 
um, perhaps. Um, uh, but yes, what, what is, is, is inherently interesting to look at, histo at, at historical RPGs or is simply for people who are historians and already interested in history. And so they, they, they like to interact with history because it is what they like to do. I think it's interesting, it should be interesting for everyone. And it also, history is very strange. It's much stranger than uh, yeah. fantasy in a way. Fantasy, if you, um, most fantasies that you read are very modern actually in their worldview. If, if you can actually take something of the strangeness uh, of, of historical texts and context, it's, it's very enriching. Uh, that's certainly something I strongly believe in in my own work, right? That yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, that you know, fantasy is predicated on the familiar or whatever. But uh, yes, like um, it's nice to to splash some cold water in someone's face uh, from time to time and just say, hey, this thing that you anticipated being very familiar is actually um, very different. Now, does that make you think that any of the other things that you think are familiar might also be different than you expect? Um, but speaking in terms of thinking about who it's for. Um, certainly I make stuff that interests me or that I guess asterisk or that people pay me to make. Uh, and then if people like it, that's great. And if they don't, I can't control that. Um, you know, I just, uh, I just released a thing about, you know, horror comic books from the 1950s and like two people read it, you know, that's just kind of how that goes. It feels like most of our academic careers, you know, not to down, but you know, how many people <laughs> read everything else that we write. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, historians may be uh, among the people most familiar with the idea of, uh, you know, writing something on a recondite subject and then, you know, everyone that reads it is someone you know personally. But going back then to the, to the issue of um, uh, game systems. Because what you have described is uh, is a uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, game that uh, games that kind of games that looks a lot like instead of Call of Cthulhu. Well, if you have a very little career progression. I mean, skills can 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 improve, uh, but um, is uh, devoid of many of the typical traits of a, of, a, of a Dungeons and Dragons game like magic um, or uh, there is magic, but it's different. So level progression is limited. Uh, you play with uh, relatively weak characters who are not heroes. So it looks a lot like other games. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know if you want to build on that think... or... Uh... Yeah, no, like... no, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just go, for... go ahead. Like mine was super quick in the, when we gave enough very early uh, phase of us doing this uh, side project. Gave a talk and one of the audience questions was like, why use D&D? Because it's primarily predicated on combat. And, you know, the kind of characters you're playing aren't going to be combative. And I think that yeah, we don't, I mean, some of us would like to combat a bit more, at least be in those situations. But, you know, you don't have to follow. And I think what's interesting is, yeah, because we have so much freedom, we're not sat with people new to our world or trying to sell our worlds so that we can. And like, uh, if we've got time after Andrea, like, um, Ali and, and Ed have been talking about mechanics that help facilitate kind of the reality of their characters as well and adding stuff. So it's D&D &D 5e plus, hmm. you know, it's not strictly D&D &D 5e. And I think I read a thread on Twitter the other day, which is like, you know, if you're going to modify it, why use it and not create from scratch? And I think 5e creates a really convenient foundation that the mechanics are there and you can use what works. And this has been mentioned already today by James and you can modify, add, subtract from that as well as best suits. As long as everyone's in agreement, you don't do it really nilly uh, at a particular moment. Yeah, I just wanted to point out before that yet d d is too easy setting for most of the people. I mean, uh, it's very less competitive compared to other setting, uh, especially fifth edition. I feel we are progressing into something um, easier, less competitive. Uh, I feel that it, in the Indies, for example, it's very, very hard to 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 have it, the character dead, you know, the stuff like this to, to die, it's very hard. And uh, I think this takes away a bit the fun because you tend to be less concentrated or to 
focus less on the game and eventually get bored. Um, Kalaktulu is on the other side of this <laughs> this matter because uh, you uh, it's really it's very very competitive and, uh, and so you have to be you, you need to stay focused and to to make the right decision uh, and I feel that in, in the production of our setting we want it to be we want it to keep the fifth edition as a core mechanics but the, the the key concept of survival is very similar to the Call of Cthulhu uh, setting. Yeah, I mean, this kind of goes back to that thing that I said earlier, right? Like, the, the you know, for whether you, however you feel about it, fifth edition is the lingua franca of the contemporary RPG world. And, uh, you know, tell someone you write role playing games and they'll say, oh, like DD, you know, that's just, uh, it, it, it's uh -huh. how, uh, even the people in your audience who don't like, Fifth edition know how it works. Yeah, I, I would. Um, I would also say that. I, um, I mean, I agree in some ways with what Gianluca said. Um, I think the the way that uh, Call of Cthulhu uh, character skills work is would works very well for a historical setting because just whatever you're doing, you're getting better at it. Um, however. Coming back to what Aline was saying about limitations, limitations and paths are actually very uh, useful for creative storytelling. And so Aline's character, um, Foybasia, has been going through this process of deciding what kind of uh, magic she wants to do. And we, it's, it's been very productive, I would say, for me as a, as a, as a DM to um and and looking at reading up on all the the kinds of magic you know and the, all the kinds of supernatural powers that um you know were thought to be operative just saying well what does what is a warlock so that's a pact you know a, a pact could also be uh with a divine being so i think jenny if jenny is worried about charisma you could always go the warlock way and but you you know why not uh make a pact with saint mercurios or uh the Virgin Mary, you know, that is, that's perfectly fine for the warlock. So of course, there's, there's a damage, uh, the damage uh, magic, I suppose, is a the problem there. Um, but okay. anyway, I think, so D&D, &D, the, 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 the spread of character uh, uh, journeys that you can make with all of the uh, additional materials that are out there are actually quite a variegated system and quite a variegated um, tree branching tree of paths that can actually be quite productive in thinking about well which is most fits with the the, the way i want to take my character in a way that call of cthulhu i guess wouldn't though and then coming back seeing as you're, we're talking about other systems so we did look at call of cthulhu i was also playing blades in the dark at the time when we first started i have uh in the back uh the back engine room of the campaign i've been using a few um blades in the dark uh, mechanics like the clock mm. you know the clock system where you tick off a not notoriety they were building up notoriety in edfu in various ways both positive and negative and that though so you you know you can add those um elements from other systems while, while also using the basic structure um for as i say this 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 character progression thing which i think is actually quite helpful you know and i i i from what i i'd be very interested to read andrea's system in more detail and perhaps play through it with a bunch of historians to see what we think about it but that it sounds like the, the concept of character progression uh and the class in different class routes that that he's he's building on also works for him in a way that uh that is is not not unique to dnd but is quite a dnd thing I mean, it is interesting that, you know, that's that's one of those things that is sort of an aspect of gaming now, like of, of games in general, the idea of sort of character advancement and class progression and experience points. And of course, those are all from D&D, &D, right? That's where that mm -hmm. comes from. It's not something that D&D &D implements. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I, I thought it was interesting. So, you know, the thinking about sort of the scope, the sweep of extant historical um, 
uh, RPGs, there is kind of that odd split where you have on the one hand something like, you know, there's, you know, GURPS Imperial Rome that's full of like tiny details about, you know, buying snails from street side snail vendors. And then, but, but that's tied to a very detailed mechanical approach. And then on the other hand, you have a game like, I don't know, you know, there's quite a lot of sort of um, Powered by the Apocalypse historical games. There's, I forget the name of it, but the one where you're convicts in Australia and there's, um, you know, Sagas of the Icelanders and there's all these other things which take a, a different approach. And I think try to uh, dodge that simulation question by having these very abstract narrative systems but in such a way that the system becomes decoupled from uh the the question of the historical setting to some extent right i mean it'd be i, I mean like a, it's like a again it's a historical novel um so those things are tied to uh to, to the way that the character um uh, you know feels and grows and develops as a person um which is uh which is another way of doing it but does kind of uh people tend to like systems where uh mechanical events map to fictional events if that makes sense rather than being just things that the players do um yeah i think you can get a long way uh by just taking away the names the names of the classes <laughs> and the names of the race I, I, uh, I remember someone uh, running a, um, uh, and I don't even remember the setting, but, you know, somewhere, somewhere in the ancient Mediterranean uh, game and just uh, scratching out monk and writing athlete um, and just continuing as is. You know, like, well, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know why they throw ninja stars, but like, it's, you know, that just how we, we tried to make it work. Yeah, in that sense, I think I have really tried to um, adapt everything my character can do uh, according to her class and the which is a bard and and warlock. It's a, she's a bardlock now, um, and so all her spells and abilities. I've really tried to adapt that and limit it to what I think would be plausible. So she won't fight with weapons. Uh, she just took a magic spell, uh, magic stone, which allows her to infuse magic into a stone and throw that if, if need be, in, in, in if she would ever find herself in combat, because I felt that would be something realistic. So yeah, that's going back to the limitations of 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 D and D and how to you know mold mold ourselves or or our knowledge or what we think is viable to the game. And at the same time, as, as Jenny said, also adding some things or changing how some mechanics uh, work. Like I came up with a couple of mechanics for my cousin. Uh, so my character's cousin, who is a kind of servant, uh, she, she, ha she has a kind of servant-like role. She's my travel or my character's travel companion. And I came up with a couple of um actions or things that she and i or she could do for me that would be a bit outside of normal um servant like uh um, tasks like just cleaning clothes or whatever and um and that would cost me that would cost me something i can't do just do this at will and ed and i have come up with a little system of how to how to do that and the system works with the nd things like bonus actions and so on <clears throat> but it's something that we that we added to that um thinking about um relationships of power uh, at that time and, and social relationships and how that works if i, if I could <clears throat> make some concluding remarks because it's already um, a bit late but uh, the round table started basically with a question and uh, a conversation that I had with James because we wanted to do some um, historical game design um, using role play games and the question was is it Dungeons and Dragons suitable or at least the mechanics um, should, should we use Dungeons and Dragons instead of another um, games mechanic and it seems to me that uh, from what you your experiences that you had is that the answer is yes I mean you can customize it uh, without breaking the mechanics to make it more suitable for uh, historical settings. 
uh, and uh, as um, authentic, I should use authentic, authentic um, historical settings rather than perhaps accurate, um, or for um, uh, historical uh, fantasy, <clears throat> because you, you dice in denial, um, from what I understand it, 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 there's a lot of historical fantasy in it uh, um, uh, as well. Uh, plus, uh, with Dungeons and Dragons, there is the uh, obvious advantage that is so well known that, uh, as James said, it's almost the lingua, lingua franca of the RPG uh, uh, RPG world. Um, that is the, my personal conclusion. Of what I learned from uh, these uh, from this roundtable that uh, it removed my doubts about the suitability for Dungeons and Dragons for. Uh, um a, a, a very a, for an historical project um and um and also um it, it is helpful because uh, a few weeks ago i went to a, a rpg night here in in, in cambridge and uh, offering a, a call of tulu uh game and uh all the students there nobody knew what call of tulu was they all looked with a blank exp expression that probably you know doesn't happen all the time but uh, i think it's reflective of uh, of the reality out there if you want to use it with students and uh, um i'm sorry there isn't much time to talk about um uh, the use of rpgs uh, there is a lot of a lot of posts in the chat about the, the possible use for outreach uh, purposes which is also a very interesting topic perhaps we can talk about it in a separate uh separate, a separate seminar or or or, 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 or round table but uh, yes if you want to um uh, communicate with others you need to use uh, a game system that is well known uh, is the first uh, um, part, uh, place of contact of of uh, wider public with uh, RPGs. I don't know if you have concluding uh, remarks on on that. I would say that it is limiting, but limitation can be good. That's my final word on TNT. Very good point. I think uh, I think personally, yeah, Dindi is uh, suitable for this kind of things. We did it; there are other people also managed to to do a great work with Dindi and in Fifth Edition. What I think is important is being open on the fact that the RPG world can be can be changed and in, in many different ways. It can have different aspects, uh, and I generally don't, don't like when people try to 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 change some to change the RPG world into something uh defined because I think there is still a lot to explore and to experiment um in the and uh, yeah I'd like to close uh, with this so um, I think the, the experimenting is the key to to find out if if D uh, D is good for this purpose of this something else with an open mind. Thank you. Jenny Alin final thoughts Well, for my part, I just love that we have two medieval historical D&D based games, but they look at the period and the world in a very different way, just thinking about magic and how we deal with that. And I think that's very interesting, again, going to that point of, you know, what is history um, and, and how, 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 are we, how are we looking at it? How are we shaping it? So that's my final final point. Yeah, mine's quick and breezy. Though. I think games are great and having like that mix and that social plus work and whatever system you use, I think D&D &D works for us. We know it, we like it, we're not scared to modify it. You know, we're not there with the DMs uh, guidebook or player handbook there with us the whole time. And ultimately, it's not the most serious of things, That's right? It's games, it's fun. And, you know, having fun with research, we tend to forget that, you know, research or we like history because we enjoy it as well. And so, you know, for me, it helps bring that out. And for me, especially in lockdown, it revitalized kind of like interest in a lot of stuff when, you know, I was sick and tired of seeing the four walls of my apartment. I, uh, I, I, in response to the kind of the starting question, right, is DD suitable? I mean, I feel like the, the first thing to say is, I mean, given that people are doing it, yes, obviously. Um, or alternatively, we have or very far from defining what that means. Is it is it suitable for medieval? Well, I mean, what what makes a system suitable? Um, so uh 
the uh, it, so it's either a yes or a maybe, um, uh, which uh, which I, I think a familiar feeling um, for uh, uh, people <laughs> doing historical research. Um, so yeah. Um, sh or, so are we? Shall we wrap up? Do you think? Yeah. Well, yes. Um, it's already up past six. Uh, yes, a so. Bit of time, so we can we we can close um we can close here. But uh, let, let's keep in touch. Um, um, I'm talking both to the audience and uh, and 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 to the panel. Um, we have a, another event coming up in November, uh, and we still have a couple of places available. A couple of slots available in our uh, Lex Arcana playtest. If you're interested, we will take this online. So um, drop me an email, or I left the, um, the, the, the the link in the chat, but uh, probably now it's covered by all the other posts. But do send me an email if you're interested. Uh, so, so Luca, just on that point, because I was going to ask the same thing that Linda has asked, and there's so much rich stuff in terms of questions, but also links in the chat. Is there any way you can, because you as host would have to do it, like save the chat. And so either those interested can email you and ask for the discussion or disseminate it some other way. That is a very good point. Well, um, we hope to post uh, these uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and um, I don't know if it's possible to just recover the chat is, uh, is beyond my uh, personal capabilities, but uh, uh, we have others in the Eastern Games Lab who, are, uh, who know the technology better than I do, so perhaps they could uh, they can help. I, I, I would imagine that it is possible, but I, I think don't know. You might we... have to uh, you might have to do it before you close down your yeah. Zoom. Otherwise, you'll Otherwise, lose the yeah. chat. So you should in the chat on the three dots as host be able to. There should be an option that says save chat. Okay. Or at, the very, at the very least, you can just simply uh, copy paste. Copy and paste all, it all. Uh, chat. I don't know if that works. All the way it works. I can. Okay, great. Uh, you are a yeah, co host, James. Probably you can do it. I don't The copy and paste is not working for me. So no, yeah, and, and I don't seem to be able to save it to either. Save as it as a TXT file, and then yeah. do you, no, at least you have something there. I've been screenshotting. Hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, Yes, uh, that's beyond my capabilities. Technical um, <laughs> capabilities. Um, okay, but um, uh, as I said, it will. It was recorded, so hopefully. Um, you may be at the back end to be able to download a transcript from. Mm, yes. Zoom online. Mm -hmm. You should be. All right. Well, I'll do well, my the best. Chat sometimes gets saved separately uh, with the Zoom recording. Yeah. If if. At least that's what happened when I was uh, teaching on Zoom two years ago. Oh, right. Okay, we will look into that. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you for the yes, panel. Thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Else. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you. Good, Good night, everybody. Good Bye, night. guys. Thank you. Good night.